showing that many of these types of body scanners could be causing already as many as 100 deaths per year. Here, they have updated reports discussing how, yeah, this is going to kill people. Despite numerous reports this week suggesting the TSA is to buy equipment to test employees for radiation exposure, the agency itself says it has no intention of doing so. Of course, back in November, John Pistole reneged on a promise to the Senate to instigate further studies into the safety of the radiation firing body scanners. Of course, they broke at all kinds of promises, including not to grope children under 12. They had to go back and forth on that several times and all the rest of it. It's a criminal organization, and I guess we're just going to give them more and more power till they shut down the Internet completely. And other news in the Ron Paul scene, his campaign is suing the anti-huntsman YouTube video makers, uh, yet, as yet unnamed, the suits against John Doe's plural, uh, as they will obviously be finding out who's behind the video, that attempt to uh, desecrate the name of Ron Paul and undermine his campaign and otherwise tarnish the reputation by portraying a video that crudely attacked John Huntsman, now out of the race, uh, as being a Ron Paul campaign video. So we'll see how that develops. Of course, it's primarily a warning to anyone else who plans to uh, smear his name that he's not going to take it lying down. That's good. Ron Paul should fight back. He has every right to get his message out, and they do all they can to black out and censor his name. You know, before they did the black out the internet, they did a you can't black this out Ron Paul campaign because his name had been left out of so many reports, polls, uh, you know, graphics where they otherwise maybe mentioned his name at the bottom of the article but refused to feature him like the other candidates. And who is Ron Paul anyway? Patrick Henningsen at InfoWars has Ron Paul versus the rest uh, describing the sea change that's happening in 2012 as uh, the old guard, including neocons and others, are losing much of their sway. We have a clip now of William Crystal uh, getting chewed out here. Richard in Independent Clearwater, Michigan. Morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Crystal and America, stop lying about Ron Paul. There is a revolution going on in this country. This is restoring individual liberty. Talk about the issues for crying out loud. He wants to end the Federal Reserve and give us sound money. He wants to end the undeclared and unconstitutional wars. What's he voted, on? didn't he vote? Didn't he say last night that he no. voted for one of those wars? You know, no. Listen to me. He voted for the authority to get bin Laden. That was not the authority to go into Iraq. And besides, don't demagogue the issue. We're talking about personal freedom and liberty. You're, you neocons are done. Go away. America doesn't want you anymore. Fox News lies. Your propaganda is a disgrace to the republic. Give us a break. All right, Richard. Bill Crystal. I think this is a country of liberty, and I don't think we need Ron Paul to bring us back our liberty. I actually am a big critic of the Federal Reserve, and I'd be happy that I'd even... I'm even... All right, all right, turn off and Crystal. And of course, those kind of call in shows are great to show the anger of the people. Crystal himself, his father, was an actual Marxist, the whole neocon movement, kind of proto neo Marxist itself. So it's not like they're conservatives or have some legitimate say in the kind of party that the real people want. Now, Ron Paul himself grew up from humble origins, worked hard all his life. Uh, but who's the other so-called leader, uh, the uh, anointed one to get the GOP nomination, Mitt Romney? How did he grow up? Let's take a look at another video that shows some of that. Mitt spent his time in the private sector working for consulting and investment companies, many times buying out companies, firing all their workers, and selling off the assets. Oh, sure, some people lost their jobs, but Mitt sure did make a lot of money. He was really good at making money. In fact, I guess you could say that he liked doing that more than just about anything. He was so good at making money that he's worth over $250 million now. So you know he can really relate to the rest of us. Well, the rest of us that are worth a quarter billion dollars anyway. Mitt Romney's co-workers really liked him a lot because he always put making money above everything else and they all got really rich too. Just look at how happy they all are with all that money. Ron Paul spent his time in the private sector as a doctor, an OBGYN to be exact. He delivered over 4,000 babies. Ron Paul's co-workers and patients loved him too. 
not because he made them all rich, but because he routinely provided discounted and free care to those who couldn't afford it. He even refused to accept Medicare or Medicaid as payment, choosing instead to work for free. Silly Ron, he could have made a whole lot more money if he didn't have all those principles. All right, boys and girls. I th and of course, there's no doubt whatsoever who the candidate of the people is, but we're up against this whole crony capitalist system. And that's why uh, the Tulsa, Oklahoma Grassroots Ron Paul Campaign Office has written a recent article, How to Get Ron Paul Elected. And it's all about how as great as the general vote is, the popular vote, the real fight is for the delegates. A lot of those delegate spots, especially at the local and state level, are open and they're just waiting for someone to show up, sign their name, and become that delegate, become a Ron Paul delegate. And with more on that now, we turn to Kay Beach. She's a full-time activist, uh, partially associated with the website ronpaulok.com, also a radio host at axiomforliberty.com, and has been active in the 2008 and 2012 Ron Paul campaigns. Kay, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, we were talking beforehand about how there's the popular vote, that's one thing, but the real fight for the presidential elections, or any election for that matter, is at the delegate level. That happens at the local and state level. That's right. And in, in fact, I mean, of course you should be out there voting at your primary, but as we all know, in order for Ron Paul to win the presidency, he has to get the nomination from the GOP. What a lot of people don't know is how does he get how does he get that nomination? And this is where the delegates come in. And this is where the grassroots Ron Paul supporters are absolutely critical because it's the delegates that vote for the nomination for GOP. And if he doesn't get that, he can't be president. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about is the delegate process. Yeah, and of course, we know just for starters here in the 2012 primary, Iowa, he got nearly as many delegates, possibly even more, uh, due to the actual process that goes on then, Romney or Santorum. And so it's really not about who the media anoints as, as the uh, nominee to be, Mitt Romney, uh, although that does have an important effect, but it's really all about the delegates. So let's, let's focus on some of the details then. Well, it, and, and I'm most familiar with Oklahoma. These rules and the processes, even the terminology, will vary somewhat from state to state. Um, the most important thing you can do, of course, is get plugged in with other Ron Paul, uh, other Ron Paul supporters on the meetup, like go to meetup.com and find the other Ron Paul supporters in your state, and we help each other out. But in Oklahoma, for example, and this is true in every state, the first thing is you have to be registered to vote, of course. In Oklahoma, uh, for example, because it's a closed primary state, you have to be registered to vote and you have to, have, you have to be registered Republican. Only Republicans can vote for other Republicans in Oklahoma's primaries. Not that way in every state. So the very first order of business, of course, of being registered to vote. And then the very next thing is to find out what precinct you're in. Um, you can look on your voter card or you can call your county election board and find out it's a number, what precinct you're in. And your precinct is the, the locality right around you. In other words, when you go to the polls to vote, uh, the people that are there voting at that same polling place, those are people in your precinct. So it's a neighborhood size, you know, usually not more than 2,000 people are in the precinct. That's what a precinct is. So after you are registered to vote and you have all that taken care of, you find out what precinct you're in, and then you want to find out, and this is the critical part, and, and what I want to say right now, I want to stress this, it is the delegates that choose the nominee. So, of course, Ron Paul has to have delegates. The first step in that process is going and finding out where, when your precinct meeting is, your GOP precinct meeting is. In Oklahoma, these precinct meetings are starting the first week in February. How do you find these things out? Well, of course, you can go to your GOP website, but you want to go to meetup.com, get connected with Ron Paul. People connect with the national uh, campaign for Ron Paul. In Oklahoma, you can go to ronpaulok.com. We'll be posting all of that information there. So get registered to vote. Make sure you're registered Republican. Find out your precinct. Then you find out where and when your precinct meetings are. And the most important thing of all, 90% of winning in politics is about showing up behind in the seat. So you have to be there and you have to talk to every Ron Paul supporter you know and let them know about the delegate process so we can get him elected to president.
Mm -hmm. Now let's talk scenario here because there's already been bantering about could there be a brokered convention? What would happen if Ron Paul or any other candidate for that matter stayed in the race even when they weren't uh, leading outright with delegates? Well, what, what would we see happen in the Tampa National Republican Convention? Well, as I understand it, you know, there's been some rule changes um, with the GOP in how they apportion delegates. I, I don't think it's a bad rule change. It seems like a fair rule change. But this rule change, which actually apportions delegate by percentage rather mm -hmm. than winner take all, um, makes it a lot more likely that it could be a brokered convention. Right. And in any event, but especially in the event of a brokered convention, it, how many delegates Ron Paul has there is everything. It's, I, it couldn't be more crucial. And even more so now since we've had these rule changes. So, Kay, what kind of scenarios could we see at the brokered convention? Would it be Ron Paul uh, vying for a vice presidential slot? Would it be arguing over policy and platform positions? Or, or what, what's happened in the past at brokered conventions? As I understand it, it is a huge negotiating process. Uh, it's been described to me as part horse trading. And, uh, and, and this is a situation I think uh, most Ron Paul people will understand how critical it is for them to be there. The one thing you can say about the Ron Paul people, I know for a fact, those guys aren't going to trade away anything. They're not going to trade away their vote. They're not going to negotiate and sell out on Ron Paul, which is one thing I fear that may make the battle for the delegates a little bit harder this time around because the brokered convention is is a distinct possibility. So yes, policy positions, uh, positions uh, for you know vice president, whatever, I'm sure all of those things are on the table and there'll be a whole lot of lot of trading going on. Well, it'll be interesting to watch. One thing is for sure, uh, Ron Paul has had himself heard. The people now know who he is and generally what he stands for, and they're still learning more. Uh, so in that sense, it's a victory just by competing. And for the delegates, showing up is a victory by competing as well. Uh, so thanks for giving us the scoop on that, and we'll speak to you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks. And we go now to break, but don't go anywhere because in this break, you're going to see the premiere of a new video Alex shot that I worked on uh, overnight last night. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube later. It is Resistance is Victory, and we are winning. Alex breaks down some of the key victories we've had just in about the last year or so. Uh, just a few of them, or many more we could have dealt with as well. Just to let you know, we are having an effect in this global fight and we need to continue to do so. So check out that video now and we'll be back in a few moments. If you are receiving this transmission, you are the resistance. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Resistance is victory. That simple initial decision to stand up and to get involved and to take action is the most important decision you can make because from that, flows all other major actions in the fight for freedom and human dignity worldwide. But you first got to get angry, you've got to get focused, and you've got to get engaged. The world is at a crossroads. We have a decision to make. No one can deny anymore that tyranny is growing and casting its long, dark shadow across not just the United States, but worldwide. But in the midst of all of this, and as we uh, move deeper into 2012, it is important to realize the incredible successes, complete and partial, that we've had against tyranny. These are just a few in the last year. In fact, after you're done watching this video, I would ask you to post comments with points that you believe have been victories so we can make a part two video. But here are just some of them. The SOPA bill, 